will go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everyone, um, to our webinar this afternoon, Student Voices, Experiential Learning in Perspective. Thanks for joining us. Uh, before we get started, you may want to take a moment, if you haven't already, to make sure that you configure your audio uh, so you can hear us. Uh, and, and just make yourself a little bit familiar with the interface here. We will be using later in the webinar the polling tool that you see um, highlighted over here. And uh, throughout the session, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them via the text box here. We'll, we will be taking questions throughout, but if we don't get here as we're going along, never fear, we will also have some time at the end to address questions that we didn't get to as we're going along. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, just to introduce ourselves, my name is Tricia Taylor Oliveira. I'm the director of the academic internship program here at UC San Diego. And we will be hearing today also from a panel of students who I'll actually I'll introduce them in a bit in more depth to you. Um, but our focus is on experiential learning. And let's talk a little bit about what we're going to be focusing on during our time together. Uh, my goals for this session are really to provide you with a little bit of a framework for thinking about experiential learning, what it is, um, and uh, things to think about as you're approaching experiential learning opportunities. Uh, but most of all, I want you to get some examples of what experiential learning really looks like by hearing from students who have been there and, and taken part in different types of opportunities so that you get a real sense of the nature of experiential learning, um, the process of how you go about getting involved with it, uh, and what kinds of experiences students actually have when they get involved with different types of opportunities. As a bit of context, what do I mean when I'm talking about experiential learning? Well, in its most basic definition, experiential learning is really learning by doing. Uh, we would add to that, though, that experiential learning is also opportunities that are approached with some sense of purpose. So that it's not only doing something, but also thinking about what you're doing and, and therefore having an opportunity to really uh, learn from that experience as opposed to just having an item to put on your resume that you're actually thinking about uh, what you're learning from the experience as you're going through it. There are many different forms of experiential learning. A few of them are listed here. Um, ones that you'll be hearing about today are academic internships, undergraduate research opportunities, as well as study abroad. Uh, there are many more uh, opportunities available to you here at UCSD, though, uh, in addition to these, um, service learning opportunities are, are excellent things to get involved with. Uh, team internship programs, internships that are not necessarily for academic credit are also forms of experiential learning. Uh, and, and sometimes students will also get involved in things such as alternative breaks uh, over spring break or, or during the summer. Uh, and even classes that you participate in may have some very hands-on interactive elements that make them experiential learning opportunities as well. As a little bit of a framework, one of the things that we like to think about with experiential learning uh, and, and this approaching it with a sense of purpose is reflection. Uh, and this has been, reflection has really been shown to be a best practice uh, when, when students are engaging in experiential learning opportunities. And this gives you a very general framework for experiential learning with three basic questions. First of all, what? What happened? What did you do as a part of your experiential learning opportunity? What did you observe, et cetera? So what? What does that mean? What do the, resu what do the results imply, as it says here? Um, why does what you observe matter, and how can you apply it to a larger context? And then finally, now what? What action does what you've learned prompt, or what next steps might you take from, from the experience? Before we dive into our uh, panel, I would like to get you all involved a little bit with a quick poll and ask all of you, what kinds of resources are you most likely to use to find out about experiential learning opportunities? So if you can use your old polling tool and just submit your responses, uh, the little button there that has the A next to it. Just a couple minutes. Ready? Did everybody get a chance to respond? All right, let's 
see what we have. Okay, so uh, far and away, everyone likes to go online first to learn about different opportunities, which is not a big surprise. Um, but as we go along, you'll hear from our panelists how they found out about their opportunities, which I'm sure includes some online resources as well as taking advantage of other sources for gathering information about opportunities. With that, let's go ahead and dive right in, and I'd like to introduce you to our panel. Uh, first off, we have Stacey Howden, who participated in academic internship opportunities. Arena Alejo, who has participated in undergraduate research. And Emily Wolfson, uh, who participated in study abroad opportunities through our EAP program here on campus. And uh, to get us started, I'd like to go down the line and ask each of you to um, tell a little bit about yourself in terms of your major, what year are you, and um, tell us about the opportunity that you participated in. Um, what program or programs did you participate in? Uh, and a little bit about what you did as a part of that. Stacey, let's start with you. Yeah, so my name is Stacey, and I'm currently a senior, and my major is physiology and neuroscience. And I also am minoring in the social issues of healthcare. And I did the academic internship program. I actually did it three times, which is the maximum number of times you can do it. So I obviously thought it was a great program. And my first two internships that I did, I did in a lab over at Scripps. And I did those as a part, um, uh, well, hopefully they'll be counting towards my major. But I was, I didn't have any lab experience going into it. So I just wanted to check out um, the lab atmosphere and get some research experience. And so that's kind of what prompted me to do those two internships. And so my responsibilities in the lab, what I was doing, I was taking care of the mouse colony and I was learning various dissection techniques and how to purify B cells and then some other research techniques we were doing with um, the lab that I was in was looking at immunology. So some various other experiments that I was involved in. And then I did a third internship over at Thornton Hospital in the physical therapy rehabilitation clinic there. And so my duties there were as a physical therapy aide. So they trained me to do different exercises. And I also shadowed therapists. And um, yeah, my role was just to assist the therapist in anything that they needed. Great, Arena. Hi everyone, my name is Irina. I'm a super senior, so that means I've been here for five years. I study visual arts, filmmaking, and human development. And the three, that, why I'm here today, I'm here to share my experiences of having studied abroad through the educational programs abroad office, through the faculty mentor program, which is a two quarter research program, winter and spring quarter, and uh, my most recent, which is the UC Scholars Program, it's a summer research program. And um, just kind of talking about what I did. Can you talk a little bit about what you did in each of those? Sure. So uh, studying abroad, I studied my the beginning of my fourth year, so just last year. And that was my introduction to research and also studying abroad outside of the US. I went to Ghana, which is in West Africa. and. There I took different classes learning about Ghanaian culture and what, what it's like for me to be an American and a foreigner out in a country that's historically and, and, and misconstrued by media. So I, I did um, an internship there at an HIV and AIDS clinic and that was my first introduction to research. When I came back to the U.S., I or while I was there, I applied for the faculty mentor program because I wanted to continue doing research in, uh, I'm a social, so I do social science and I do art and I wanted to combine that and continue that from working at an HIV and AIDS clinic to doing the faculty mentor program. So I sent in a cover letter and contacted a professor in the anthropology department. And so that was my coming back from fall, I winter and spring I did the faculty mentor program through the anthropology department. And continuing from that, which I encourage you all, once you step into something, once you open a door, there are more doors that open. 
And so another door that opened up is uh, applying and getting into the UC Scholars Program, which was the summer program. And I did my research uh, on mental health, so Filipino Americans and mental health, because I am a Filipino American. So that was, uh, I, I forgot to tell you also what I did through the faculty mentor program with the anthropology department. I looked at how um, how mental health is, how YouTube and other online resources are changing what we're learning about mental health. So kind of how we, you, you just did a poll about what kind of resources you're learning about these opportunities and online. So that's where my art background is getting into and the social science. Thank you, Raina. Emily, can you share a little bit about your experiences? Um, hi, I'm Emily, and I studied abroad in um, Santiago, Chile for one year. And um, while I was there, I was fortunate enough to do two internships, which were both um, research-based. One was in the fall, and that was at a nonprofit that works in poverty alleviation. And in the spring, I interned in a visual arts museum. Um, and like I said, both of my um, job duties were mostly research-based, but it was also, um, they were both also excellent opportunities to explore two areas in which I'm interested in having a career. Great, thanks so much. Um, and if we can just go back down and if you want to, some of you started to touch on this a little bit, but if you can add a little bit to, uh, what was your process of deciding what kinds of opportunities to get involved in um, and applying? How did you get started in this whole process? Because I know sometimes it can feel intimidating with so many different opportunities out there. Where do I begin and, and how do I get started on this? Can you talk a little bit about your experiences with that and Stacey, can you start again? Yeah, sure. So I think I also just uh, found out online about AIP through an email blast that they sent out. Um, and then I just went into the office and sort of asked questions, checked it out, went to an orientation, um, and decided that this was a program that I wanted to get involved in. Um, and it seemed like a fairly straightforward application process, so that part wasn't difficult. I think what was the difficult part was deciding which internship I wanted to apply for. Um, and I think at the time, I just wanted to check out the whole lab experience and get some research experience because I, um, a lot of my friends had done it and I wasn't sure if it's something that I would like. Um, so that's kind of what prompted me to do the lab internship. And um, through that internship, I realized that I don't actually want to pursue a career in the lab. And so that's what prompted me for my second internship to look at something in healthcare. And for that one, I thought a little bit more about what would suit me personality-wise, and I determined that um, something in rehabilitation would suit me. And so that is what prompted me to pursue my third internship. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So I keep going. Uh, a little bit about how you decided to pursue some of the different opportunities. You talked a little bit about how some opportunities segged into other ones, but yeah. maybe initially, how did you get started with looking at EAP or the faculty mentor program, and what were, what were the application processes like for those okay, programs? Okay, so I hope you all consider studying abroad and looking into different research opportunities, since I'm, learn I'm sure from your first year experience classes, you're learning that you're in a university, like research university setting, and so that makes it very unique in terms of you choosing what you want to study, uh, aside from, you know, the GE classes and the major classes that you take, you have this opportunity to explore your passions through project-based learning. And that's basically where research is. And I didn't know that I was interested in research uh, until I studied abroad. And the study abroad process, I think it was just my drive to say, hey, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of getting uh, burnt out here at UCSD. I want to see what it's like outside. And um, so the application process for studying abroad is first like what Stacey is saying is, aside from the internship, like where do you want to study abroad? I wanted to study somewhere I, where I had no idea what the culture was, what people spoke, and, and most of the times I, I actually didn't really know where Ghana was actually on the map. So I, I wanted to go somewhere where, where I didn't know much about the culture and the people and the geography, where it was also economic, I guess, like a little bit cheaper in terms of cost of living, because uh, as a financial aid student, I'm wor I was worried about getting, you know, financial aid for where we're gonna go, and the exchange rate also mattered. 
And aside from that, how does it apply to what kind of career objective I want, which is more social justice based and and looking into, like what I said, my, I study art and I study a social science. So how can I combine those in a study abroad program? And the, the process is, out, so what you're learning is that it's important to to ask, keep asking questions and not give up in terms of, you know, there's so much red tape and paperwork. So that's basically my study abroad process was processing all these paperwork of getting a statement of purpose written in, just like what you did to get into college and uh, getting all these signatures from your different departments, getting all these vaccines. And so being patient with that process and from that long process, I, I know I, it took me eight months to, uh, the whole eight months, it, studying abroad, you have to plan early. And so it took me eight months to get all this paperwork done, uh, you know, get my letters and my recommendations out to the, the host country and also in booking my flight. So as long as you have the social support that will get you there and the drive, and, and you know where to study, it's going to happen and it's going to open doors into hopefully research. Yeah. Emily, how did you uh, decide to study abroad, that you wanted to do that, and, and where you wanted to go? Um, what prompted your decision making? I always knew, I always kind of just like associated college with studying abroad, and so I always knew that I wanted to study abroad. Um, it was just a matter of where and when. Um, but I wanted to better my second language skills, so I chose a Spanish-speaking country, and I also wanted to do a program that offered experiential learning, like internships and research. So that's kind of how I decided to study abroad in Chile, because I knew that I could practice my Spanish as well as get some um, intern experience. And um, I went straight to the source. I went right to the study abroad office because they have really helpful staff and a lot of great resources um, to help you with the application process. And like Arima said, it takes a long time, um, but it's totally doable. And there's people who want to help you. And as long as you stay on top of the deadline and ask for help when you need it, then it's definitely accomplishable. Um. You've each mentioned a few things, long procedures and needing to start early, et cetera. Um, any particular challenges that, that you all met as you were um, going through either the application processes or participating in your programs, and how did you manage those? Um, yeah, so I also studied abroad, and I thought that paperwork was a little bit more intense than for AIP. For AIP, you just have to apply the quarter in advance. So I think it's just knowing a quarter in advance that you want to participate in the program. And um, yeah, I think just being organized, writing down all the deadlines of the paperwork that you need to do is what keeps you on top of it. Um, and just um, like Emily said, asking for help, I think is the biggest one. Um, I didn't realize um, when I did my first internship that I could ask the counselors to help me look for an internship. Um, and I think I realized that along the way that they were there to help me and they could look over cover letters and resumes with me. And so I took advantage of that later on. And so I think I just wish I would have done that in the beginning. But yeah, I definitely think as long as you go to the office that um, that is in charge of whatever experiential learning you're interested in, there's people there who can help you um, figure out everything that you need to do. Sure. Um, I just want to say don't be discouraged by application processes um, because they are, like you said, totally accomplishable. Um, as far as challenges in applying, um, I think it's just an extra thing that you have to take care of on top of your schoolwork. But the study abroad process was so rewarding that it's totally worth it. And um, it, is, it is doable as long as you, you know, stay on top of your deadlines and meet with your advisor and um, you're motivated to get to know another part of the world. Brenda, how was it connecting with faculty for the faculty mentor program and trying to find someone to work with? So it's, it's just like uh, what they saying with the AIP, it's a quarter in advance. So actually the deadline just passed, November 25, but 
keep keep tabs for next year. <laughs> it's it's a it's basically um, I know all of your first years, but then there's uh, maybe you've heard of 99s and 199s. They're called independent study, and basically it's a four unit pass no pass class that you you just you and your your mentor your professor decide on the structure and the process for doing an independent study through the faculty mentor program is very simple you just have to basically get into the database as long as you have you meet the requirements of having 90 units or more uc uc units having a 2.7 gpa minimum and you fill out this quick uh, Google form of, you know, what what kind of research interests you have, who might you, um, what might you want to do with this research, and and then, you know, some demographic information. So it's a very quick, uh, just getting you into the system application process. The tougher part is actually connecting with, with faculty. And this is what I encourage you all to learn how to write cover letters, write resumes, and go into your office hours. The professors is really going to be helpful because then, even though now you're into the, the faculty mentor program database, it's you. It's up to you to seek out the professors you want to work with. So you get a date. You get access to all the list of all the professors willing to work with you, and it's just it's up to you to figure out who you want to work with. Um, whether it's a lab or a project they're already working on or whether you want to propose something. So, for instance, I, the, um, the anthropology professor was working on global health. However, I wanted to tie in my media background, so I proposed an independent study in which I did. Uh, I, it was, it's independent of her research. Okay. Thank you. Well, let's go ahead and move forward now that we've heard a little bit about what you all have done. Um, before we dive into the next section, we'll do another poll of our audience, see if everyone's still out there. Um, if you could, again, use your polling tool and choose one of our, our options here, A, B, C, or D. What kind of goal, what goal would motivate you to pursue an experiential learning opportunity? Um, a, are you looking for exploration, a way to learn more about a field, an industry, a country, yourself, whatever the case may be. Um, B, are you looking for networking opportunities, building contacts? Um, C, is skill development what's most important to you, uh, learning skills for a profession or graduate school, whatever the case may be? Or D, is your goal really to make a difference in the world or serve the community? You can choose the one that best fits on your drop-down list. Ready? All right, let's post them. Okay. All right, a little bit of a mix this time. A lot of you are looking to explore, maybe gather some information um, and develop skills. Uh, and, and then a few of you also, they're wanting to just build your networks and as well as um, making a difference out in the community. So with that, let's talk a little bit about um, We've talked. About, we've heard a little bit about what our student panelists did. Let's hear a little bit now about why the those experiences were were important to um, each of you. Can you each share a little bit? Let's start with Emily this time. A little bit about what you learned from your experience. What do you feel like are some of the most important things that you're taking away from this? Um, I guess I want to start with um, saying that studying abroad was the best year of my life. Um, it was amazing, and I encourage all of you to do it um, because it. You know, it changed the way that I think about myself and the way that I think about the world in really profound ways. And um, not only did I get to go out um, in the world and get to know a new country and a new language and new people, but um, I also got to see what it was like to study in a university in another part of the world. I got to work in a foreign community and that really um, pushed me outside of my comfort zone and, you know, um, I got to see how people work in another part of the world and I think it's really valuable considering that um, our world is increasingly globalized and um, increasingly international. 
And so I gained, you know, not only work experience, but work experience in, in, in another country, which is um, of personal interest to me, but I think also really valuable in um, our increasingly interconnected world. Thank you, Marina. So what I got out of studying abroad and doing uh, research research uh, programs is I got more serious about school. <laughs> so I, I came, I've come a long way. I'm a super senior, and I've, I'm stacked with two majors. So it took me a while. I came in as undeclared. Maybe some of you are declared. And I didn't necessarily come in with the with the useful tools. I didn't know how to talk to professors. I didn't know how to study. I didn't know, you know, where how to focus in class. So going through that whole eight eight month um, study abroad application process prepared me to be patient with just the whole study process and being a student, learning how to balance learning how to balance our family life, our friends, and studying and looking into the future, that was really that was really important for me. And learning that, you know, there are failures, so I have failed classes. And that, you know, that's part of the process of being a student. And also looking towards more doors that open and helping strengthen our background. So I hope that that's something that you get out of once you start into the study abroad process and looking for scholarships, it's going to really strengthen how you how you appreciate UCSD. I feel like you learned. Um, yeah, I feel like I learned most, um, or the most important thing I learned was just what I want to do with my life. Um, I think I had thought that maybe I wanted to do healthcare, but I wasn't really sure. And I think um, it really, doing the internships really made me sure that um, I didn't want to do the lab, that I did want to be in healthcare, and that I specifically wanted to be in physical therapy. And I think that was really useful. I think also I just learned a lot about time management and just being a better student overall because these internships, they were 10 to 15 hours a week at the internship site. And plus on top of it, you do a research paper throughout the quarter, which I don't think I mentioned before. but. Um, I think that um, is a lot of time as a full-time student during the quarter, and I think I really learned about how to manage all my time so that I could do all my schoolwork and do my internship and really fully invest in both. Um, so I think that was a really important uh, lesson that I learned. I think also through the different papers, I became more confident in my writing skills. Um, uh, as a part of AIP, you have a faculty advisor, and so it was really encouraging to me to hear my faculty advisors say very positive things about my paper and about my writing ability, and that just gave me a lot of confidence. So I think, um, yeah, confidence as well as um, knowing my different career paths were the two most important things for me. Great. And, um, so I think you touched on most of these areas, but I'd like to ask each of you uh, to expand a little bit on what you've already shared with us to talk a little bit more about how your experience impacted you um, personally, professionally, and also academically. Marina, can we start with you? Personally, professionally, academically. Mm -hmm. Personally, I, I'm growing, growing more into myself and uh, as a first generation US college student, this is very uh, this is a very new experience for me since my family didn't we didn't really know that there is such a thing as a college and looking into research is, is definitely some a new topic that I come home and then I can talk about or not talk about. So personal growth is having that conviction and integrity to follow what I love doing, which is, doing art and being a social scientist and, you know, learning to work with papers, knowing how to read books and journal articles and things like that. Professionally, what we are learning from all these experiences is networking. And you learn that's so important because then, you know, sometimes if you look for a job, it's really who you know or, or what kind of scholarship is being offered. You go to the programs abroad, abroad office and ask, or you go to the career services center to see when a job fair is coming. So professionally, learning how to interact in a professional environment and having being accountable of, okay, I didn't go to class, so how do I, or I missed office hours, so how do I contact a professor and be professional about that? 
I have personally, professionally, and my career goal is, from all all the math that I've done is I want to go into graduate school in the PhD program for anthropology or sociology so I can be a professor, hopefully in the future. Great. Thank you. Maureen, you want to talk a little about how your experience has impacted you? Maybe. Um, so I think, if anything, my experience has just confirmed my career interest and future interests. Um, so I was always interested in um, international relations and travel, and this was my first really extensive um, period of time that I spent abroad, and I loved it, and it just um, reaffirmed that this, like that is something that I want to work into a future career. Um, personally, um, like I said, I had to navigate a whole new city in a different language, and that really boosts your self-confidence, like you, can, you see what you're capable of doing, and and it makes you realize, um, or I guess just coming back to UCSD, it was like, if I can manage my life in a foreign country in a different language, like, what can I do here? And also, like, when I came back to UCSD, like, I realized how many resources that we have here um, for undergraduate students. All right. Um, let's go ahead and move on to our next section, which is now what? And you've all, again, already sort of started touching on this. Um, and uh, talked a bit about some of your career goals, et cetera. But um, you've talked about a little bit about what you've learned. How do you think you'll be using that as you move forward? How are you going to um, take what you've learned and use it as you're applying to graduate schools, taking the next steps in your career, et cetera? How, how are you bringing what you've learned with you? Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I definitely think that I'm going to take even the stuff that I learned in the lab, even though it's not going to be what I'm going into the, for the future. I think there's lots of lessons that I learned in the lab about um, just time management, managing lots of different tasks at the same time and not being overwhelmed. Um, there was physiology aspects, which are also going to be used in the hospital. So I think there's a lot of lessons that I learned through that. But I think also um, through physical therapy, um, and I learned that uh, volunteering in various different settings is very important. Um, in the hospital, I was in two different settings, um, primarily in an ortho setting with, um, you know, various rehabs after surgery, but there was also another clinic that had neuro, um, and that is actually what I'm more interested in. So I think at this point, I'm looking for more opportunities to get more experience in other settings with physical therapy, and I think that's what um, AIP really did for me was just open my eyes to how many how many different opportunities are available and um, and just equip me with being confident to go and apply for them. Before I did AIP, I thought my resume was super lame. I didn't have solid references or a lot of experience to put on it. But through these programs, um, and then I also um, got a job and went abroad. And so there were a lot of things in the last two years that really. Um, yeah, that boosted my confidence and made me able, um, when I apply now, to apply confidently um, to these other opportunities and really, um, yeah, be excited to get involved in them. Um, so I think those are kind of the next steps for me is looking for even more opportun opportunities. Great. Thank you, Raina. Right. So um, what I'm what I'm learning out of it, is, or how do you think you'll, you'll take what you've learned and, and use it as you're moving on toward either continuing your education here at UCSD or thinking about graduate school, okay. job applications, et cetera? So what I'm getting out of it is, uh, so as I said, I participated in two research programs, and both of them, they prepared me. They're, it's mandatory that I presented my research at a conference. And that's, so what I'm learning out of that is communication skills. Regardless, it's important to know how to explain whatever material to another person in a concise manner, and also very, very, uh, very, uh, I guess, um, very personable manner. So I'm learning that what I'm getting out of it is being compassionate about what I'm researching and who I'm also working with in the research process. And also in terms of, because I want to go in, to academia to be a professor, I have to learn. It's important for me to know how to give, how to, how to um, 
give information. Uh, so that's that's what I'm hoping to get out of my gap year is kind of volunteering somewhere or finding a job somewhere where I can continue learning how to present research or do research and then apply for grad school where I'm going to do that. So when you go to grad school, whether it's a master's or PhD program, sometimes you become a teaching assistant, like the TAs that you have in your first year experience classes, and you have to learn how to create your own you know, lesson plans, uh, eventually teach during lectures, and things like that. Um, so like I said, I want to have a career um, that's internationally focused and um, so it's really important to have international experience on your resume and not only did I have the opportunity to study um, in another country but I also had the opportunity to work there so those are both um, really valuable experiences for my future career. Um, additionally, I do want to go to grad school and um, I would like to study international development or social work and um, the internship that I did abroad, the first one was with a nonprofit so that deals with social work and international development. So these are really solid experiences that I have that I can use um, to show that I that I have experience and that I'm interested in these fields um, for future research or future employment. Um, these are all great things. Also, I learned another language, which is, a, I think, a valuable skill and a, a solid skill that you can tell people that you have. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to start winding things down, but I'd like to give each of you a chance to share what advice do you have for students out there who are interested in pursuing some of the various types of experiential learning opportunities that you've gotten involved with. Um, what advice do you give to them? Or what would you tell them? What, or, and maybe even what would you have told you, what do you wish you had known in going into all of this? Um, we'll start with Emily this time. Okay. Um, I guess the most important advice that I have if you want to study abroad is that you start early um, because the process takes a long time. But like you said, it's totally manageable and it's totally worth it. Study abroad was the best year of my life. I had a blast. I learned a lot about myself. And like I said, I like gained a lot of really important um, experience. Um, advice. I would say specifically study abroad related is that the staff and the students who work in the study abroad office really want you to go abroad and they really are there to help you. Um, so if you need help or if you're stuck, go to the office. Like They want you to study abroad and they will help you get there. So um, I guess my advice would be to you know, stay organized, start early, and if you need help, go to the office because they will help you. What advice do you have? So asking for help is really important, and uh, I'm sure what you're learning is that you, you have basically lots of different advisors. So someone in study abroad, go to the programs abroad office. You have your college advisor, and you have your department advisors, and you have um, the... So Emily works at the programs abroad office. Stacy works at the academic <laughs> internship program, and I work at the Career Services Center as an intern. So you can come to us who are just, you know, undergraduates like you on a peer level and ask questions. You don't know what, you never know who you're sitting next to, what kind of information you can get. And so it's really important to learn how to ask questions, seek as many advisors and mentors you have. And that's never really clear cut who's going to be your mentor. It could be your professor, it could be a TA or, you know, just a senior in your college. Yeah, I would just advise you to get involved early. I think I waited until junior year to really get really involved with things, um, especially things that were future and career oriented. I think my first two years, I basically just got involved with social things and doing academics. And of course, of course, those are important as well. But I think don't be afraid to start checking out career options and volunteer and work experiences earlier. Um, I think uh, you can get so much done in college and I wish I had more time to, um, to do a lot more things that I want to do. Um, I think just advising students to not be afraid. Um, I was really intimidated. Um, I think as I already mentioned, applying because I didn't have a lot of previous experience, but I think just showing that you have enthusiasm and a drive to learn, that really speaks for itself. And there's a lot of professors that are willing 
um, to take you up in research if you show that initiative and that drive and that willingness to learn. So I'd say, um, yeah, just to, to go for it, to look for these opportunities and get involved earlier rather than later, just so you can maximize the, the number of things that you're involved in. Um, and as I'm hearing you talk about your experiences, I'm wondering, too, what kinds of things were each of you involved with? I'm hearing some wish you were involved <laughs> with, too. Um, maybe prior to going abroad or, or getting involved with research, there, it seems like there's a lot of piggybacking of one opportunity upon another. Um, were there things that you did that you felt like helped prepare you for these experiences? Or were, or, were, or were your study abroad and internships, et cetera, kind of the first entree for each of you into um, getting more involved? Um, yeah, I'd say AIP was the first, um, like, the first career-oriented thing that I did. I also went abroad uh, in between my AIP internships, um, so that's a great experience. I can attest to what they're saying. Um, but I think before that was just gaining confidence um, in college and navigating the whole college sphere. I think I spent a lot of effort um, in academics, and I think that did prepare me for these future experiences. Um, I worked on my study skills, um, my ability to approach professors and get tutoring help and all of those things, and I think those were very valuable skills that I developed in my first two years, um, as well as just um, developing people skills and different social organizations that I joined um, so I think those two skills were what I was developing in my first two years, even if I wasn't involved in certain um, experiential learning programs. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the first two years, like what Stacey's saying, I spent a lot of being involved socially in many social orgs. And that was really important in my having a foundation of friends to turn to and mentors uh, and also, but I'm, I learned that there is a bigger, you know, aside from this, you know, friend drama, social, social group drama, you know, learning academics, there's a bigger world outside of that. And I think my introduction to that was when, and maybe you've heard of Sun God. Sun God <laughs> is this festival that, that happens once a year. And for my third year, I was not at Sun God. I was volunteering at a hospital a shadowing, job shadowing a radiologist. And I'm learning, wow, you know, there's everything, this bubble happening at UCSD, and then there's the rest of the world. And sometimes missing out on different social aspects, social things, it's, eh, you're not missing out. <laughs> <laughs> because there's a bigger world out there. There are people you can meet in, you know, volunteering opportunities, talking to a professor. So not being afraid to stand out sometimes uh, and seeking things for yourself. Think about how you can grow the person through, through you know, kind of maybe not being so much in the norm, if that's the norm. <laughs> um, so before I studied abroad and had all of that experience, um, I was really focused on academics. And I did some little things, like I tutored English, and um, I volunteered one quarter at the, the Troy School. Um, but I think that after going abroad, I came back and I realized that was like really the start of like me getting involved and having experiential learning. Like I said, now I work at the study abroad office and I just got um, an internship for winter quarter that's related to international development social work. So yeah, I guess um, when I studied abroad and that's really when I started getting involved in experiential learning, and it's been great. And I'm, like Stacy said, like, I wish I would have done it earlier. There definitely seems to be a theme here of you kind of get bit by the bug. Once you, yeah. once you start getting involved in opportunities, new doors open, and, and you get excited about taking advantage of other opportunities as well. I think getting connected with people makes a big difference that way as well. Well, um, thanks everyone for your insight. I do want to open it up in case uh, anyone in our audience has questions. Please do go ahead and, and uh, submit your questions via our chat tool here in the webinar, and we'll be happy to uh, answer those for you. I'll take questions, but I do want to also make sure that you are aware of some of uh, 
the resources out there. These are just a couple of them. These are the, some of the programs that you heard about through our panel, the Academic Internship Program. Um, academic Enrichment Program is where Irina went to find some of her uh, faculty mentor program, many of the summer research programs, et cetera, which, by the way, if you're interested in looking at a lot of the summer research programs now, is the time to be looking and thinking about applying. Um, and then the programs abroad office also, you can see their websites there. Um, and, you know, we saw that everybody is very interested in, in getting started by using online resources to um, find information. I think that's a really great starting point to get your basic information, but as you, I think you heard from our panel, ultimately it becomes much more helpful if once you get that basic information, you talk to people and um, gather more information as well. Um, my contact information is also here, so after this, you're welcome to um, be in touch with me, too. Okay. I have a question that all, well, you all have participated in it, but um, was study abroad affordable? How did you manage the cost? Start with Emily. Um, so, yeah, there, there's this myth that study abroad is super expensive and that it's not affordable. And um, a lot of times study abroad can be the same cost as um, a term at UCSD, or depending on where you go, it can be even um, cheaper depending on the price of living there. Um, but there are programs that are more affordable than other ones. Um, but no matter who you are, like you can definitely finance a trip abroad. Um, for a lot of programs, your financial aid, if you have financial aid, is applicable to your study abroad program. There are scholarships available for every student um, based on college, based on what you study, based on where you're going. Um, I really encourage you to apply for scholarships if you're considering studying abroad because they can really help you pay for your trip. Um, and lastly, if you're um, super concerned about the cost, you can pick one of the, one of the less expensive programs. All right, and we also have a go-getter out in our crowd who wants to know whether it would be unreasonable to do all of these programs um, during their time here or whether you'd recommend picking and choosing. Well, I want to go ahead. ahead. Um, so it depends when you get started. Obviously, if you get started as a senior, do you need to pick which programs you want to get involved in? I think if you get started as a sophomore, um, then it is possible to get involved in a lot of different things. Um, and yeah, I think definitely pick the few that you really, really want, especially if study abroad is one of those. I'd say you want to prioritize that because um, obviously you're not going to be multitasking when you're studying abroad. You're going to be in that country doing just study abroad and maybe an internship at that site or something that's involved in that program. But I'd say first you want to plan when you want to study abroad if that's something that's important to you. And then look at the rest of your time at UCSD and budget your time for these other programs. Um, like I said, I didn't get started until I was a junior, but I still was able to do quite a few things. I was able to do three a AIP internships, study abroad, and work. So it is possible um, to get involved in a lot of things. Maybe not every single thing that's available at UCSD, that would be pretty overwhelming. But I'd say, I'd say figure out study abroad first if that's something you're interested in, and then budget your time with these other things. But the earlier you get started, the more that you can do while you're here. Rita, do you want to add to that? You've done quite a number of <laughs> different opportunities. How did you explain all that? Just jump into it. <laughs> the pool. Uh, the pool of resources, and so it's like what Steve's saying, you, you got to really, so maybe, okay, hey, why don't I look into doing research my, so doing study abroad in my second year, doing research my third year, and then we'll see how it goes senior year when I apply for grad school. So sometimes, actually, if you go on the career services website, or just in general in any college website, they have a four-year plan. So that might help you kind of figure out, okay, what should I be doing as a first year, as a second year, as a third year, fourth year? What kind of, because then remember, you have lower division classes and you have upper division classes that you have to balance with, you're still a student first. So aside from these internships, you gotta, we, our priority is to be a student and finish at UCSD. So planning, being specific, okay, when, when is this application deadline? 
when am I going to, so hypothetically, I'm going to study this year and I do this year. So thinking in years already, having a 10-year plan wouldn't hurt. <laughs> it's scary, but right? That's kind of what college is preparing us for. I'd like to add to that, too, the thinking about having a plan is that it's important, I think, for you to, um, if you're hoping to take advantage of a lot of different opportunities, be talking with your advisors and your major um, minor, if you have one, at your college to really think about, especially for some of the programs that are academically oriented, how do those fit into your four-year plan um, and, and how can things count for you so that you plan your, your academic schedule accordingly. Um, so, And with that, I, I always recommend it. It's great to have a plan, but um, leave yourself a little room to explore, too, because one opportunity does kind of open a, new, a door to a new interest or, or a new opportunity as well. So that can also happen. Um, did you want to add anything else, uh, Emily, to um, that? I how reasonable it is to participate in I guess the right of opportunity. I would say just don't be overwhelmed um, by anything that we said that might have <laughs> sounded scary um, because these are really rewarding experiences and um, you you can do them. They are manageable and they are worth it. Um, and yeah, <laughs> I have something to add. Um, surround yourself with people who support you. So whether you know they're also driven in study process, the study abroad process, or you know applying for the same scholarship, that kind of camaraderie is really helpful. So don't worry about the people who say, "Hey, let's let's go kick it to the beach." If you have somebody who can, a friend who's really studying for the same exam as you are, stick with them because then they're going to be. They're going to be your buddies for the tough and the, the nice times. <laughs> well, that maybe segues into uh, another question that we had, which is how do you balance relationships with work? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think it's, uh, it is a challenge. Um, you'll find out the more years or the later you are in college, the busier you are, and the harder it is to make time for, um, for social things for all your friends. Um, I remember freshman year, I definitely would just go and hang out in someone's dorm till like 4 a.m. Um, and it would be fine because the next day I, would, I could nap after class because I didn't have to go to work. Um, and so I think um, it does, the older you get, the more I've had to plan out times and be intentional about people, especially when you move off campus, you'll find this is true. Um, you don't just randomly bump into people in the hall. You have to be intentional and say, hey, um, do you want to meet up? Do you want to hang out on Friday? Um, so I think that's just something that you'll find out. And so I'd, I'd say as a freshman, appreciate the time that you have to just um, connect with people, to be living with your friends, that that's really important um, to be, um, yeah, having that foundation of those friendships now. And I think how do you manage work and relationships later? I think it's just um, remembering how important relationships are. You don't want to get burned out doing all these different experiences, and you will if you are not taking time for your friendships and your family. Um, and so I'd say just, yeah, being intentional and making that time. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Um, Getting involved, I think, is really important. But like, like I would say, um, in agreement that you know, um, get involved, but don't overbook yourself. You know, leave time for your friends and your family because that's important and fulfilling too. Just like um, experiential learning. Mm -hmm. All about balance. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, oh, I have. Someone asking if it's hard to find internships freshman year. Did any of you do internships as freshmen? Or? I, so my first year, I I wasn't. I am an. I'm still part of the social org. It's the Caribbean uh, Filipino. It's a Filipino Filipino American cultural org, and I was a board member my first year. So that was kind of. I don't know if it's an internship, but it's a very important experience in learning how to plan high school conferences learning how to be in a meeting and going over time and coming home at late at night. Uh, 
Uh, what was the question again? It's very hard to find internships freshman year. No, it's not. So, like I said, there's the independent study, the, nine, one, the 99 for you all. And if you go on the career services website, there's uh, there's a link on internships. There's also maybe ha maybe you've heard of Port Triton. Port Triton is a re is a website for and through the career services website here that you have access to all the internships and the jobs. So whether you're a work study student or not, so go on Port Triton. Just search it up online. Yeah, and I have a couple things to add. I think it would it is harder um, that there are more opportunities for upperclassmen because you have more classwork and more experience. And so I will say that there are more opportunities and it may be easier to get an internship later on, but it's definitely not that there are no internships available for freshmen. And like I was saying earlier, I think um, in order to um, if you don't have previous experience as a freshman, the way you sort of present yourself is that you are willing to learn, you are willing to put in the effort, and there's lots of companies that want um, freshmen or sophomores because they want you for a longer period of time, so they want to be able to train you and, um, and really see your full development, so you have a little bit of an edge in that aspect. Me as a senior, I was looking at different opportunities and a lot of them wanted two-year commitments, and obviously I'm not in a place that I can do that. So I think that is one thing that is really good about being um, a freshman or a sophomore is you can make those commitments, um, and so you can get a lot out of one opportunity um, because employers sometimes are specifically looking for students that they can spend a lot of time investing in. So I'd say those are opportunities um, that are more geared towards um, lower classmen. And if you're looking at academic internships, then generally you do need to be at the junior senior level to be doing those internships for academic credit. But as you all mentioned, there are many other ways to get involved and start building your experience, whether it's through internships, um, through student organizations, or even working on campus can be another good way to start building some experience in a relatively non-threatening type of environment too. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, it looks like we've answered the questions that you all have submitted. Um, so I'll wrap things up, and I just want to say thank you to our audience for joining us. Um, I'd also really like to say thank you to our student panel. I really appreciate all of your insight and input. Um, and um, on the logistical side, I want to say thank you to our first year experience planning committee and to Jacqueline um, Guan, who helped to coordinate uh, this webinar, and to the ACMS team who's here providing technical support to us to make this possible. Um, and of course, to all of the faculty and staff here at UC San Diego who make these kinds of opportunities available to our students. Because uh, uh, without, I think, the dedication and support of people who help to facilitate these opportunities, um, they wouldn't be possible. So thank you all for joining us. And uh, we will make this uh, webinar available online later. So if anyone's interested in revisiting or, or sharing it with your friends, uh, we'll make it available to you. Uh, thanks very much, and have a wonderful afternoon.